I want to talk about changing the economics of the network. She talked about culture. I'm talking about money. So I want to talk about the control plane. The control plane is what connects the internet. It is, the internet is a network of networks. You've heard that a thousand times. How do these networks connect? Well, they connect through the control plane, which is defined by the border gateway protocol. Why is it called that? Because if you have a network of networks, when those networks touch, that's a border. It does not refer initially to international borders. BGP directs traffic step by step, hop by hop, so that it arrives. Now, why is BGP interesting in terms of attacks and vulnerabilities? Well, BGP is not that easy to map. You can't draw a map like this necessarily, even though routers have place. So suppose you wanted to send something from FedEx from Tullahoma to Memphis. It may go to Madison if FedEx has a center there. And if it does, it goes to Madison every single time, just like your postal routes. BGP routes are not like that. Well, for one reason, because in BGP, it might make sense to go, I don't know, across town in Denver by driving to Kansas. <laughs> and why would that make sense? Well, because the fibers and the networks are owned by different people. If UPS <clears throat> owned all the roads across town in Denver, it would make sense for FedEx to drive through Kansas. So why does it matter? Because if there's no control plane, there's no internet. And if there's no secure control plane, none of our goals can be met. If I can interrupt and reroute all your transmissions, remember the very first opening session when they were saying, oh yes, back when we had these tiny, tiny little key sizes, and we see everyday innovations in cryptography, we have a better understanding of selecting keys, so your session keys cannot always save you. And if they can't save you, then you're not going to have integrity in your data. And even if your crypto was perfect and secure, you, it is possible to just black hole data. So basically what happens is internet paths changed very rapidly. Some of them changed back and forth all the time. Um, it, they just flap back and forth like, oh, Kansas, not Kansas, you know. Internet, they can change very rapidly, and once you hand that packet over to BGP, that's it, right? So take these super secret, incredibly important intellectual property nuclear code memos across the country. Okay, that's fine, but you know, maybe I'll sell them first. So one of the things I've liked about this conference is the introduction slide. So why do I care about something like BGP, and why am I making an argument that it is legitimate to take a political and economic perspective on something this fundamental? That is because I am a fish who swims in two waters. I have spoken at the White House and the National Press Club and RSA and Black Cat. I changed in-core thermocouples at Catawba Nuclear Station, and I was I think the only person at Catawba South Carolina Nuclear Station who thinks that it is awesome that I was in the House um, gallery, you know, around the edge when Obamacare was finally passed into law. So just like I'm an intersection, so is BGP. It's a fundamental problem. So one of the, the very first hearing on Capitol Hill about computer security, they brought up the fact that v BGP could be hacked. Uh, one, of the, uh, young, uh, one of the then young men from Loft who became a DAR DARPA program officer said, I can bring down the entire internet in 15 minutes. And we've seen that happen in other countries. If you look at some of the internet takedowns the, in Egypt, in Syria, um, in India, they've gone much farther than this. It's basically a BGP attack. It's a fundamental problem. It's foundational technology, and we've made very little progress. Why is that? Well, 
I believe that I have an answer to why that is, and it's the economics. So I'm going to argue not just about BGP, but more largely that if we think about security as a thing, if we bring in economics and think about how do we make it so that everybody wants this by aligning investment in benefit by design, we could have a more secure internet. I, I mean, in terms of the privacy, I would go back to that panel and say, it's a lemons problem. It's a market problem. So what is this hijacking I keep talking about? It is not like carjacking. So I picked this e-crime attack uh, because Bitcoin heist. So as you know, we all know, Bitcoin is a distributed ledger, cryptographically signed technology that's implemented where you gain value by coming by calculating the correct matching hash, right? So that's computer intensive. So people get together, they form a big club, they call it a pool, they search collectively, and then they get the rewards and they share them. So there was a large mining pool and they used Amazon servers, Amazon cloud servers to coordinate, not to do the mining, right? Go Amazon. It turns out they set it up with no passwords or security. So if anybody wants to talk to me about the brilliance of Bitcoin miners, I have the whole reception. Um, so what the attacker did was said, hmm, maybe I'll just tell those, the world, that this tiny little slice of the IP space that the miners are using, that's in Canada. I get to say evil Canadians, which you never get to say. So. This evil Canadian, and there is only one, um, uh, was able to get tens of thousands of dollars with super quick burst of incorrect control plane information. So why do people commit crime? Is this a criminal problem? There are basically three arguments that are popular in crime science today. One is routine activity. If you were walking down the street and you saw a wad of cash on the sidewalk, you'd pick it up and say, you know, rejoice. I must purchase better wine for Jean. Because actually, legally, what you should do is you should pick it up and you should take it to the cops and you should describe when you picked it up and they'll hold on to it for X days. And then if nobody comes and explains they left this amount of money, you know, very few, very few of us are that good. I mean, it would take you hours, and also, it's cash, right? But that's literally a, literally a crime, right, to take in unsecured wealth. The lack of social support, I'm sure you've heard about the broken window theory that says if there's no social support, there'll be more crime. And relative economic deprivation. I mean, here we have a picture of a, a, a wonderful young man who spent all morning stealing a loaf of bread and then gave it to orphans if you remember your Disney. But uh, relative economic deprivation is particularly strong on the internet because we have people, as, as you noted, from all over the globe with tremendously different standards of wealth where what I would be annoyed by and write off as my credit card would change, would you know, cover their rent for a month. So if you look at these crime theories, and you think, how can we measure this? Well, with routine activity theory, you can say, all right, they're economic rational offenders. We're going to look at available targets and lack of oversight. Because frankly, if you pick up $200 uh, off the ground, you're never going to get busted for it. That's part of it. Part of it is culture. Lack of so social support, endemic practice, lack of oversight if there's no deterrence, and relative economic deprivation, which is just GDP per person. right? So we looked at GDP per person and secure internet servers and relative exports, and we took a lot of variables, and we found that there were some significant hotspots that crime theory could absolutely identify. This is, this is what is happening. This is a crime that is happening. Just like smuggling, we have hotspots for hijacking. There were also some other places that stood out, and if you recall, uh, her, her map of underground fibers, the reason for some of these is obvious, right? It's just where the fibers are, it makes it easier if you have a lot of routers.
But there are some countries that kind of stood out, and they stood out consistently across all the data. In 2014, Cisco bought BGP Mon, and so the data sharing is not, the data sharing changed. And the, we, so what we did is we, we clustered them. We said, all right, we did our multivariate regression to look at crime, and some of those things just did not make sense. So basically, we looked at secure internet servers, which is availability and access and how much internet there is, and world governance indicators, which is how much crime there is. And you can see how you could draw a line through that, which is part of what we got from our multivariate analysis, but there was a part of it that really just did not make sense. There are some real outliers in this. And when we looked at those outliers, we found something kind of interesting, which is that excluding Comoros, which is the little tiny island with all the fibers coming into it and all the other fibers going out of it, these are places with either active conflict or long-standing civil strife. So there was a good argument that something else is happening besides crime. So we have a very serious problem, and we all have to work together to secure BGP, because it's not like your browser. I can choose to secure my own browser. I cannot choose to secure my own BGP. So how do we make that work? Well, it's a coordination problem. I could spend the rest of the talk trying to get everybody who is in this room and similarly aligned and completely gracious and willing to help to move one seat to the left. Just think about how difficult that is in this kind of coordination in this little space. So how do we do that? How do we increase the investment and uptake of secure routing? We redefine the problem as economic and change the nature of the good. So the idea is if we look at the economic threat, we can change the economics of BGP to beat that threat. And if you want to use the market, you have to have a market that functions. The goods have to have some basic characteristics or the market doesn't work, right? The goods have to be rivalrous which means if I eat a cupcake, that cupcake is gone, consumption is rivalrous. You cannot have my cupcake. It needs to be excludable, which means I can protect my cupcake from other hungry people. And it needs to be transparent, which is like, this is definitely a cupcake. It is not a lemon. And when you have these kind of failures, you get different kinds of goods. And the problem with public goods is we don't have a way to invest in global public goods. Now, goods that are non-excludable but rivalrous, you're going to invest much more than you would in a public good. And similarly for goods that are excludable and non-rivalrous. To give you examples instead of just names, obviously, cupcakes, ready for lunch. Um, fisheries are non-excludable. I cannot keep you off the ocean, but if you catch a fish, I cannot catch it. And uh, that was a non-excludable and non-rivalrous experience of sound. <laughs> All right. So, excludable and non-rivalrous, like a gym membership. We can all, <laughs> all go to the gym. I did not pay them to do that. So, we can change these. Way, the way we do security, we can change it. Like, IP addresses are non-excludable but rivalrous. So, if I claim an IP address and your traffic goes there, that is, I, I, and email, I can, I can keep you out of my email, right? But I can't prevent someone else from reading, from copying the email. So, other kinds of goods can be changed by design. So, phishing detection, we see a lot of sharing, closed sharing information groups, uh, incident data, and I believe that we can change BGP updates. Of course, most goods are not pure goods, they're mixed. They're a cupcake in the gym. So traditionally, my work has tried to change the nature of goods. Here we go. By, for example, when 
uh, vulnerabilities. We all know about bug bounty programs and the market for vulnerabilities. Before bug bounty programs, there was a uh, young man, people were arrested on the stage in DEF CON for exposing a vulnerability. Because not only could you not, you could only sell it to criminals. That was a problem. So what are hijacks? Are they a crime? It's linked to spam. It's linked to malware. And deep packet inspection is linked to both. So I want to make an argument that in addition to machine learning and clustering, there is a real reason to believe there are nation state actors. So beautiful Denver, people go there for the skiing. There was a months long hijack of the traffic in Denver. Why is that? Well, because Denver, outside of Denver, is actually the concentration of America's surveillance infrastructure. NORAD, the US Northcom, Cheyenne Mountain, the recently named Space Force. <laughs> and there's also a building that um, everybody claims isn't there, but is there because I've seen it. And so if it existed, it would probably be associated with surveillance. Also, Peterson Air Force Base, the Air Force Academy, and Buckley Air Force Base. So all of that's in a tiny little area. And interestingly enough, as you saw in my example, it might make sense to go through Kansas because FedEx owns the roads. So sometimes Denver to Denver communications goes from Denver to Dallas to Canvas to Denver. For months, it went from, let me see, let me see if I can do this. Denver to Chicago, yikes. Denver to Ashburn, to London, to Iceland, which was a hacked ISP. It was um, generally, generally reported that it was owned by the Russians at the time that this attack was happening, and then it went back through Montreal. This was not detected at the end point because the delays were so, so insignificant. So how can we solve this? Well, the first panel would tell you we need better crypto. We always need better crypto, right? Crypto is the oxygen of security. If we don't have it, we can't do much. So there's been two proposals on the table for a very long time, which is resource public key infrastructure basically says, this is my IP address, you can't have it, and BGPSEC, which says, this is my IP address, and this is where it should go. So PKI origin val validation, it just says I'm going to associate the network with the origin. And that can stop both IP address hacking and, bla and black holing, which means that you send your data to an IP address and BGP takes it to, you know, dev null, it deletes it. But it can't do anything about BGP hijacking. And as long as BGP hijacking is a problem, we're going to be systematically, structurally, fundamentally vulnerable. So BGPSEC offers full path validation. Not only is this my IP address, but this is my IP address, and this is the correct top, and then this is the correct next step, and this is the correct next step, and we are all exactly where we should be, right? Of course, BGP, it would be more like, but, it only identifies trusted connections if we trust everyone with a public key. So, and it, the wall, it's only as high as its shortest point. So if there's a part where it just kind of peters out and you can walk around it, you can hijack it. It also requires that we trust the public key of every participant. So if we're willing to trust, I don't know, Putin's public key, then sure, we could roll this out, and then we would know things were being hijacked as soon as we looked, just like they are now, only with more crypto. <laughs> so one of the ways I want to encourage people to invest in things that help to cr generate technologies that help the person who invest in it. So mismatches between the autonomous system where something connects to and it's the jurisdiction are uncommon. Traffic leaving San Francisco to go to San Jose typically does not go through China. 
It did for a while when the U.S. had a bunch of soldiers in Afghanistan. So Facebook traffic actually went through China for a while. So traffic starting in one place and ending in the other place doesn't need to go through any of these places, but it has gone through all of those places. I am, in my research, arguing for individual autonomy. The thing about, I don't think we will ever come to a time where we all have shared values, but we should be able to express our own risk perceptions and values on the internet without impinging others. I think we should be able to choose one, select a path, and then say, I only want this data to go out if it goes through this path. I want it to go directly there. I don't want it to go there, 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 and there. And to do this, to show you that this is possible, we created a route reflector. We named it Bongo because Zebra is a famous open source product and Quagga is, but Bongo is the ungulate with horns. It's the one that can fight. So this is just basically a picture that says, we use Bongo, we put it between, and it can work with uh, different architectures, including architectures for uh, you know, cloud data clusters. It works with SDN. And so basically, how can an organization mitigate data exfiltration? It can choose to use, there we go, so much for animation. It can choose not to send the content. That is all you can really do today, but you can do that. On the other hand, if it was widely adopted by individual organizations, hijacks would be identified much more quickly. So we tested this on 50 financial ISPs. The only one that dropped off in our theoretical run is if we all had Bongo, was the main bank in Iran. And for some reason, it has very bizarre routing patterns. Um, sometimes it goes through Russia. Sometimes it goes through Germany. Sometimes it goes through Oman. So if we understand hijacks as criminal and economic, as well as nation state that uses routers and wires that are in specific, very real countries with very different priorities and cultures, we can do politically and economically informed design to solve those different kinds of problems. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>